lift our hands and bless the name of the Lord. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Father, we give you praise and we give you glory. Hallelujah. How many of you are ready for the word again this morning? One thing is sure, one thing is guaranteed. There will be healings this morning and there will be transformation. All right, before Apostle comes up this morning, media, I want you to please show the video for us and then we will receive God's servant. We may please be seated. God bless you. Walking the depths of sorrow, where wounds refuse to heal, we weep for our pain and seek solace in the wilderness of our soul. But a cry echoes through eternity from the ancient hills of Gilead. A balm is revealed. A remedy for the broken hearted, where pain intertwined with purpose. There lies a whisper, an ancient promise, where brokenness meets redemption, where the fragmented are made whole, where weary hearts and souls find rest. Gilead. Can we lift our hands to God this morning and just thank him in a moment? Let's give him praise. His banner over us is love. Let's thank him. Let's give him all glory. He's the one who heals us true and true. He's the redeemer of our soul. Our ever-present help in times of trouble. The one who sees us. Let's thank him. Let's give him all praise, all glory, all adoration, all thanksgiving. That your heart is open for the word today. That his words will meet you right where it is needed the most. Thank you, Lord. We bless your holy name, Jesus. Can you take a moment to pray in the Holy Ghost quickly? And do so. Pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. In, the Spirit. in Jesus' name, we are praying. There's a worship sound I want us to raise. Um, let please come up as we raise this sound if you know it you can sing along if you don't just lift your hands to god and just bless him from your own heart thank you lord you gave me hope you made me whole at the cross Singing holy is 
And we give you praise. We oh, thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give Jesus a big hand. You may please be seated in a moment. Amen. This morning we are privileged and blessed by divine orchestration to have two of my brothers with us two excellent ministers of the gospel we have in our midst this morning apostle jonathan shekoya thank you sir pleased to have you here and also we have in our midst apostle awal suleiman thank you sir Please, we may be seated. I almost passed out when I saw Apostle Jonathan. Ah. Amen. But the Bible already said it is good that brethren should dwell together in unity. Amen. So I'm starting a new series today and it's a tweaked word. Gilead. And... Um, let me tell you what this series is. This series is my gift to you and to the body of Christ. But to you primarily. And as I start teaching, you will understand when, what I mean by this is my gift. Um, as I was praying to God towards a new season in my life, um, this is one of the instructions for the new season amen so let me leave it there turn your bibles to the book of luke chapter number four luke chapter number four and we're going to start the reading from verse 18 luke chapter number four if you're there say amen The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has sent me to preach the gospel to the poor. The word poor there is synonymous to the word poor used in Matthew 5 that blessed are the poor in spirit. He hath anointed me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty them that are what? Bruised. Now, I want us to pay um, very important attention because I want to show you a few things that you need to consider about that text. Look at what the Amplified um, translation says. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me, the anointed one, to preach the good news, that is the gospel, to the poor. He had sent me to announce release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to send forth as delivered those who are oppressed, who are downtrodden, crushed, and broken down by calamity. Now that was a strong one. That there is a form of healing that has nothing to do with organs of the body, but has a lot to do with the mind. There are forms of healings that have something to do with the spirit of a person. Because when, it, when the spirit of a man is broken, 
The Bible says, who can bear it? As a matter of fact, the spirit of a man ought to be strong to carry his, inf his, his infirmities. Are you seeing that now? But the target of the devil is to first attack our minds. So I want you to understand that the healing that comes from the Lord is not just physical healing it's as touching your physical bodies but also the nature of your mind. Are you still there? Now give us that amplified translation. Luke 418 if they can project it. I want you to see something there. Look at this now. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me the anointed one, that is the Messiah, to preach the good news, that's the gospel, to the poor. He has sent me to announce release to the captives. So, there are people who are captives, but they are not locked in physical chains that can be seen with human eyes. Some are trapped in the past, some are trapped in unforgiveness, some are trapped in traumas. Some are trapped in different forms of things and they are still trapped. So there is the grace to release the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. Now look at this. To send forth as delivered. Say it again this morning, I go forth as delivered. Those who are oppressed. That is those who are downtrodden, bruised. Oh man, life bruised people. Those who are crushed. It is possible for the spirit of a man to be crushed. If you read Genesis chapter number 45 from verse 27. Maybe you can read for context. All right, but I will start from verse 27. That's the story of Jacob. Esau had been taken from him sorry um jake joseph had been taken from him but his spirit was crushed look at it so when they brought a new word all right of joseph to him and all he has said to them he saw the wagons which joseph had sent to Caim. the spirit of jacob their father was revived so all the while something had died inside so, what I want to do this morning is to help you face your fears. And let me give a warning as I start teaching. At some point in this teaching, if you want to cry, cry. Sometimes it's okay to release it. If you want to lay down, lay down. And um, that reminds me. Bodyguard. <laughs> ah, hey. By the way, so they are not bodyguards, but they are protocols to make sure there's order in church. Sometimes we show up in church looking strong after several meetings in about six to seven weeks streak of traveling from place to place came back yesterday and i ought to be back somewhere else today and we are still in the middle east this week to be back on sunday morning to preach here on sunday <laughs> so sometimes they have to protect the man of god from the people who love him <laughs> amen but it's all good and they are here for you not against you let's give them a big hand so what i'm saying is that there's liberty of the spirit all right you want to come to the front and just all the garment of christ not my garment christ christ Amen. One time I was preaching, somebody hit my leg. I didn't know how to tell the person, I will fall down. <laughs> Amen. 
All right. So, but it's all good. We must embrace liberty of the spirit. So don't let anything hold you down. Don't let anyone hold you down. Is that okay? What I'm saying is that be free to express your heart. So when they brought the words of Joseph, the Bible said the spirit of Jacob was what? Revived. That means something had died inside. It is possible to be with a man whose spirit is dead. It is possible to be with a woman whose spirit is dead. Something has been mortified inside. It's cold. It can no longer respond to love, affection, and stimuli. Some people feel it is strength to say that you are not an emotional person. It is not strength. It is sickness. Because our emotions are not signs of weaknesses, but they are medium through which we express ourselves. We only contain them within safe spaces. You can love. You can forgive. In fact, you can be pained. And you can be hurt. It's not a weakness if you are hurt. If someone that you love so much suddenly exits your life, it's going to be painful. And it's okay. It's life. And that you cry in the midst of such a situation doesn't mean something is wrong with you. It doesn't mean you are the weak one. And there's a way men have been raised. Real men don't cry. But real men are emotional. If Jesus wept, you can weep. It's not a weakness. Because we are we are having a societal culture where men are holding on to so much and they are making conclusions that people are only seeing the reactions. There are fathers who have become dead towards their sons. There are sons who have become dead towards their fathers. There are brothers who have become dead towards their sisters. There are husbands who have become dead towards their wives. They will do their duty for duty's sake, but they are gone. One of the signs of death is when there is no longer response. All the receptors are gone. All the sensory neurons, the motor neurons collapsed. Gone. It is not a crime if you can respond. In fact, I will prefer the one who even responds too much than the one who has no response. You are still safe around a spouse who maybe overreact than the one who doesn't. You can be out of touch for two weeks and he doesn't miss you. And he says, I'm busy. Where there is affection, there will be emotions. So I don't want us to cover the things going on in our souls with religious facades and just show up and try to, oh, how are you doing? All is well. I'm good, bro. No. No. The fact that you ignore it doesn't take it away. You have to face it. Is that okay now? So this morning, my duty is to walk you back to the past. And let's rebuild. Psalms chapter number 11. Let's start reading from verse 2. Psalms 11 from verse what? 2. And I'd like everyone to fix their gaze as we study um, different scriptures today. If you are there, say amen. 
Now look at this. For lo, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string that they may, what? Privily shoot at what? The upright where? Upright where? In heart. So it means that the devil has special interest in your heart. He has special interest in your heart. Now look at verse 3 now. Let's read this together. One, two, three, go. If the foundations be destroyed. Please, do you mind? Can we take this three more times? Two more times. Last time. If the foundation is out of place. So the foundation of our lives, when you are building, the foundation is the first structure that is built or erected intentionally depending on the destination of the building. Okay? So, how far the building will go is not determined by your intentions. It is determined by the success at the foundation level. So, if you get the foundation level wrong, even with the best intentions, you will have to stop somewhere. Is that okay now? So, the, the, the devil has seen that one of the ways to strategically, and when we talk about warfare against our souls, um, 2 Corinthians 10 from verse 4 says that, for, from verse 3 says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh, but the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting our imaginations, and all that. Listen to this. Whenever you hear warfare, don't think might. Think strategy. Think strategy. It is only strategic to eat a man at the point that he will remain continuously eaten. And if there's any time in a man's life that if you eat him wrongly, and I mean any human now, it is as though you have eaten the person for the rest of his life. It is the season of his childhood. That's the place... You see, sometimes we, we ignore the idea of raising children. And permit me to pause here to give us a better sense of purpose around the subject of marriage and parenting. Listen to this. You cannot, and let me say this, it will be wickedness to decide to marry a wrong person because you know time is going, forgetting that that person becomes the environment of your children. It is wickedness. You should not settle to marry someone whose mentality you don't want to see in your next generation. So the idea of marriage goes beyond the ability to contribute good genes to make the children look good and then batter their minds. It's a responsibility that God has given to you as singles, for those who are still single, to be intentional about knowing the one for whom or with whom God has ordained you will spend the rest of your life. And that must be vetted, but not in the hurry. So parenting now is a very sacred responsibility. And let me say this. We are still dealing with traumas are associated with parents of the last generations. And yet, we are dealing with a generation who have no sense of sacrifice. We are dealing with fathers who don't want to be fathers and mothers who don't want to be mothers. The trauma of the next generation will be greater. Because it is, one, it is possible to be pained and yet become worse than those who hurt you. It is possible to be grieved and yet become worse than those who grieved you. You are not ready to walk down the aisle if you are not ready to commit. If you are a man who believes in sleeping around, don't bring an innocent girl to suffer. 
You are a woman who believe you are I don't know what gen I should put you. Gen Z or Gen Alpha. And your mentality about marriage is fire for fire. Stay alone for a while and fire yourself. Don't bring children into that atmosphere where they'll be wrecked because of your decisions. Because before I start teaching you and you feel like the victim, let me help you not to grow to become a villain. There are boys and there are girls. You see, um, Pastor, please come. This is, in mathematics, there's something we call an integer. So let's say this is a negative integer. Please come, sir. No, okay, let me use a lady. Okay, let me use his wife. Ah, okay. And this is a positive integer. <laughs> let's say this is minus two. And let's say this is plus two. This lady has worked extra. She's a plus. This guy has abandoned himself. He's a minus. She believes that because of the level of training I've received, what I know and all that, when I meet any man, what I know will overshadow him. Plus two, minus two. The answer is zero. I'm saying that there are people that your home training cannot repair. Yeah. You must let God do his work and it must be clear he has worked. Even if you will say I do. There are disasters waiting to happen. It takes those that their prayer partners have left to marry them. And I say this again. Why we understand that the church is a spiritual clinic, the disasters are also there too. There are wolves, there are sheep, there are goats, there are lions. You see, listen to this. Listen. What Jesus told Peter is, follow me. I will make you fishers of what? Men. Uh -huh. When you fish, you don't just catch fish. You can catch a snake too. Oh yes. You can catch a poisonous fish. The one that you have to know how they skin it. If not, that's your last meal on it. That you find the person in church doesn't mean you've seen the child of God. No. No. Is that okay now? So I'm putting a disclaimer to it. Oh, the, in fact, the way I knew it's my husband was that that day I saw him around the apostle. Disclaimer. <laughs> Listen. The concept of building a family is laid on the foundation of sacrifice. If you want to be right, always, don't start a home. You can't take nonsense. No, go on Twitter. Join the girls. Shout. Go on a rampage. Do all those things. You see where a girl is kneeling down on her wedding day to serve the husband drink. You are angry. Go, go, go. <laughs> What's that? I, I don't do all those things. All this, 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 this. Vex, 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 vex. Lock yourself in the room. Be it up with your own vexing. Don't bring that plague and hang around someone who is trusting God for a destiny partner. Not a problem. And let me tell you this. You see, this thing called pressure, one of the things it does is that it blinds your reasoning. That you see a person, but let's do it on time. It is not for those doing it on time, but for those doing it right. Take your time. Don't get to the point that you will wish you did. Take your time. Be sure. Ask questions. Look at the, our mind and his mind. It is not the best colors that will raise your children. Or the best food. Let's believe that those questions are useless questions. You are not a chef. And even if you are, you are not going to cook all your life. True or not true? Yes, what's your best food? So I, just, I, like, I like spiced gizzard. 
Please be seated. Thank you. Say, I hear. I hear. Say it again, I hear. I hear. You owe it to God and to his investment upon your life to marry right. And I've said this again and again. People went on a rampage. The church must learn to normalize breakup. It's part of life. There's nothing special about it. it is, this is, listen to what I'm saying. It is possible that these two people are pastors in church. And they feel they are not good for each other. It's normal. Never marry anybody because of what people say. If your life goes bad, they will still talk. Yes, sir. Last, last. Because somebody was sharing testimony the other time. And then said, Tipe, I don't know what that means. But because, <laughs> see, see. Last, last, everybody will leave your issue and face their problem. You want to get married and all your thinking is about as fine as you are and as fine as he is. When you come together to produce children, how fine they will be. That's your thoughts. <laughs> have you seen fine children who have been messed up with a very brutal man? Please be careful. Is that okay now? That foundation needs to be laid. Marriage is very honorable. It is not what you rush into. If you are not ready to commit, don't marry. Yet. The guy doesn't do church. He says he watch from home. No pastor around can pastor him because he's given to the word. And you like him like that. He's my own. My only one. My one and only. I don't even do any kind of marriage. Where any pastor will call me and my wife, we are, we are, we are, we are men in our own right. Your, your definition of masculinity is to be one that has no sense of accountability. What a way to be a man. And that in itself is a sign of low self-esteem. Because you feel once there is someone who provides instruction and guidance, they are evading your space. What do you think about yourself? How do you perceive yourself? What makes you feel like a man? Is it money? Or the ability to control a woman? What makes you feel like a man? That's why when many men go broke, they lose it. Because the only thing that makes them feel like a man is the money. What's masculinity beyond money? Say, you don't have money now. Say, women, you don't just have women. If a woman is any more than you, you must find a way to bring her down to your level so she can obey. It is not control that makes men. It is leadership. Some women say, I, I, I can't marry a man. I don't, when they do marriage vows, I don't do to so submit and to obey. Let me tell you something. The reason why you don't do that is because you have dated. You will know, you will not know when you submit. Submission is not demanded. It is commanded. A life compels you. You see the leadership you've not seen in your previous generation. You are compelled to honor him. You will not know when you say my king. Because he is. And if that's still your feeling, it's a sign you are dating a fool right now. Break it. I don't care your age. Are you there? Let me tell you something. Let me tell you. I've, I've not even, I'm going to start, but let me tell you something. No, I need to talk to you. Are you there? Yes, let me tell you something. Masculinity is under attack. Because leadership is becoming scarce amongst men. Leadership is demonstrated with a lifestyle, not with words. That you follow God in a persuading way that your children want to be like you. That's leadership. That's leadership. Now we go online and see girls and talk about sexual life and what they've done with their body online. And they know that when it's time to settle, they will not struggle. 
and the good ones struggle. They, are, they know that because they know that we are in the era of foolishness amongst men. What's left of them is testes. They are gone. That's what's left. They are gone. It's the era of foolishness. See, people come in church and get angry and say, pastors this, pastors that. And, and they are online. Say, I, I can die for Machala. I can die for David <laughs> And they come to church. It's when it's church matters. They vent. You are not a man. You're just a boy who needs to be trained and taught. Are you still there? Yes, or should I round up? So let me balance it. There are girls who deserve to be single all their lives. The Bible said it is better to dwell in the corner of a house than to be with a contentious woman. This girl has no capacity for peace. Trouble. Fire. Everywhere. Born. No respect. No regard. Nothing. And they believe if I can weave my wigs like this, I will get a man. You will get a foolish one. You know, when David was going to kill Uriah, he said, put him where the battle is fierce. But let the valiant men withdraw from him. There are men that the valiant men have left. Be careful. Take your time. You will wish you did. Take your time. <laughs> Take your time and prepare yourself. Now, listen to this. Waiting is not just the passage of time. Waiting is a process of building. That it's been five years since the last man asked you or doesn't mean you are waiting. You might be decaying. Just getting bad and worse. Say, I hear. I choose to wait correctly. Now, I asked you a question while I was teaching this before. That if anybody marries you now, has the person been favored or judged? Now, now, hear this. Hear me, hear me. The answer to that is not in screaming, but by what you make out of your spouse. There are hunters and there are gardeners. There are people that the last phase of a girl's beauty is her wedding day. From that moment going forward, she begins to shrink and depreciate till she look like a witch. He will bring other women, he will taunt her, he will do many things, but she married him like that. There are demons in Kaftan. Beware. Apologies if you came with Kaftan. But you know my heart. Am I correct? I want to request. I, I, I intend to um, finish this teaching by 11.30. So I intend to take my time. Are we cool? Are you sure? Ah, okay. There are people now whose mentality about marriage is is just for the moment. Imagine someone who is marrying someone just for the moment, and the person's intention is to do it for life. You wonder why you are making effort, but the other person is pulling it down. Because you didn't ask the person, how long do you intend to go with me? Say, why, why do you love me? Say, that time, uh, as you passed, as you passed, and I look at you, I said, what is this? <laughs> huh? <laughs> then you now hear the girl, Sister Naba. Now say, uh-huh. 
And as she's saying, uh-huh, she's shaking it. Shaking it. Uh-huh. You know what she's saying? This is all I've got. That's all my assets. Front and back. Nothing here. What do you have apart from What do you have? Marry mentality, not just beauty. Now, I use the word not just beauty. Yes. <laughs> not just Hold on a minute. So you will not say it's not like you find, but I married you as a dealer from God. When Adam saw Eve, as it message, the first word he used was wow. If your own is yeah. <laughs> so you <don't. laughs> is that okay now? Listen to what I'm saying. There are many people who felt religion push them to marry the person they don't love now we are telling you do you love the person don't say i trust god <laughs> i trust god you know that's why when we did the interview with the couple the missionary couple who said when they went after the woman he didn't like i, I had to ask them are you saying you've done a marriage for 37 years and you have no affection towards her so he said he came. How he came? I said they even had to decide because of the rush with which he came on what to do. You now said, you are my wilderness gift. <clears throat> Be careful. Now, pay attention. Many people do marriage wrongly forgetting that they are going to be the environment around which the next generation will be raised, thought, and built. As many of those who are seated are still trapped in the pain and the effect of the kind of environment they were raised. And upbringing is a very serious thing. Look at what the Bible said in Proverbs 22 verse 6. Look at what the Bible says in Proverbs 22 verse 6. If you are there, say amen. amen. Proverbs chapter number 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. The Amplified about this is very serious. Look at the Amplified. Train up a child in the way he should go and keeping with his individual gifts or bent. That's a serious word now. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. Um, fr- fruits don't fall far from the trees. The foundation season of your life forms so much. It forms your perspective. It forms your ideologies. It forms your perception about reality. It forms your perception about marriage. It forms so much. It forges the kind of individual that you will grow up to be. And that's why you can hear a professor at 70 speak about the upbringing. Because there is something about it that just doesn't go away. Whether good or bad. The way you see life, the way you react towards life, the way you talk, the way you see people, the way you perceive marriage, the way you perceive the opposite sex, the way you perceive yourself, the way you perceive your giftings, the way you perceive your abilities, they are all formed by your childhood experiences. Who are you? 
how do you see yourself? When you try to remember growing up, what comes to your mind? How do you see your giftings? Let's start from simple things. Do you think or do you believe you are fine? It all depends on those who form the concept of you to you. Do you feel you are handsome? Do you feel you are beautiful? Do you still feel you are big head? Do you still feel you are tiny? Do you still feel you are dull? Do you still feel you are unprofitable? Do you still feel you are a dwarf? Many of these names doesn't go away in our minds. And sometimes they, they form a niche. You see, if you take a rope and tie a horse to this tree, and you do that consistently for months. Even when you put the rope around the horse and refuse to tie to the tree, the horse still won't leave. Because the object that is now holding it down, it's the mind. Sometimes you have left the abusive past, but you are still tied there. You've left. You are no longer around the wicked auntie, the abusive father, the wicked stepmother. And there is a misconception that people have. Now, when we talk about dysfunctional background, it has only to do with those who are from broken homes. There are homes where fathers and mothers are together that is more dysfunctional than a broken home. There are single, and I say this with all sense of responsibility to the church, that there are single mothers and single fathers who are better off with their children there than to raise the child around that fool. The devil has used fear to keep people in places where they died and the children are left to wonder. One of the prayers I've been praying for you is that God will keep you alive for your kids. Amen. Maybe you didn't like the prayer. Yeah. You know, one time, yesterday night, I just jokingly asked my wife, and I just said, who is going to sit with me to interview me for stories? I've listened to many experiences that I've cried with people I interview. And I said to my wife that even the most gory one can be fitted into one month of my experience. And sometimes you carry these things and you just see, you see, some of us have fought through life to be able to deliver life from death. Because when the devil handled your childhood, he wanted to kill you there. Because he's afraid of what you can become. So all the attempts, all the effort, all the things done were to make sure that this one doesn't come out. Do everything possible to silence, break, destroy, and make sure this one doesn't rise. Kill the might in him or her. Sometimes that's the battle strategy around your childhood that you've got to understand. So you cannot cooperate with the devil to kill you at the time he wants to kill you. You've got to keep bouncing back. The abuse, the hatred, the insult, the lack, the depravity, they are all part of an awesome strategy to make sure you don't come out. The father you had who beat your mother and cheat on her, or the one who never look back. It's more, an attack, it's more of an attack on you than just that woman. It is attack by proxy. And if I can't face an arrow towards you, let me face it on an institution that you belong to. So when I kill that institution, you die in it. 
You've got to understand that. That the devil wants to weaken your foundation. And many of you, and uh, you are still battling with the past. You see, when a child is exposed to pain, the body will go on to grow. But the child is still trapped in the old body. It can be so bad that you can desire that there are meetings that need to hold so you can explain what happened 20 years ago. It can be so bad that you can desire that there are individuals who need to come back from the dead so you can talk to them to their faces that what you think about me is really not true. It can be so bad that you need justice about matters of many decades. You know why? Because you are still trapped. Now they look at you and say, see how much you've grown. But in depthly, you are still there. My earnest prayer is that this morning God will bring you out. I didn't hear amen to that. It will bring you out. And it will heal all that needs to be healed. Money doesn't take away childhood trauma. It doesn't. More friends doesn't take it away. More degrees doesn't take it away. More women doesn't take it away. More men doesn't take it away. Enjoying nice vacations doesn't take it away. There is the healer. The one who can go to our past and restore the years that the locusts and the canker worms have eaten. There is a void in the heart of a man that only God can heal. Because if you are not careful, many of the things you now begin to do and pursue will be an attempt to fill in the void of the old days. You can marry someone to silence the abusers of your past. And you can stay in an abusive marriage because they said, we know it will not work. And then you now rather die there than to walk out. Even when you know you are dying. And by walk out, I mean separate for a while and let there be repair. And there are cases that we have seen that this person doesn't have what it takes to fulfill God's plan in this person's life, what do we do? You can pursue a degree, you can pursue degrees just to answer the questions of your past. You want to ask yourself, why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you doing what you're doing? There might be insults that have been hanging in your mind, things that they said we know you can't do. We know you can't amount to anything. We know you can't become anything. We know you can't get a degree. We know you are not smart. We know you can't stay with a husband. We know you can't stay with a wife. And you abandon your direction to prove them wrong. You are still trapped in your childhood mind. There are people who are afraid of going to school to add more degrees. Because of what the secondary school teacher said. There are people who believe they are not intelligent. Because of what, sometimes, what even their parent said. Have you seen the case of parents who compare children with each other? You are not as smart as your sister. You are not as smart as your brother. Look at you. What are you good for? You don't bring me joy. This is my hope of tomorrow. This is the one where I'm going to look up to. I will not expect anything from you or think who speaks as though they are God. And sometimes parents look at their children and make them eternal enemies. You compare them with every opportunity you have. Some will even call their children Esau and Jacob. There are parents who go on to tell their children 
you are a mistake. There are parents who perceive the children as the reward for their mistakes. They see the child as a possibility that ought not to be. Never you think that you cannot have a dysfunctional experience around your own blood. There are mothers who hate their children with perfect hatred. And there are fathers who do the same. And you wonder, why? Sometimes maybe the child reminds them of what they ought to be that they can never be. And they express frustration on the child. And the devil is using them successfully to kill something about the child. It's an attack on your mind, on your emotions, on your perception of reality, of people, of life. Sometimes the attack can be so much you decide, I will never get married. Sometimes you can decide, I will never marry from my village. I will never marry from my place. Sometimes you are right. Sometimes you are wrong. How do you know that you are still trapped in the past? How do you know that you are still trapped in your childhood mind? One of the ways to know is when you don't want to have any memory of it. It hurts you. Your heart skips when you think about it. There are things you have removed from your mind, not because you are better, but because you are better off not remembering them. And sometimes, you've numbed the thought that you barely remember anyone. But that doesn't mean it is not in your subconscious. Because every now and then, there are things that remind you of them, and you cry. When Adam and Eve heard the voice of God walking in the cool of the evening in the garden, they hid themselves and covered themselves with fig leaves. And they said, for we are naked. And God said, who told you that you are naked? He understood. That that new consciousness they, have, they, have, they now have, someone said it. And the fact that they said it doesn't mean it is correct. It is possible to be here that all you believe about yourself is a lie. And before you know it, you start behaving everything like the lie. Since they call you wicked, you have become. Since they call you daft, you start behaving like that. The tendency and the ability for productivity began to die when they said, we know you will not amount to anything. And even when there are little overblocks and failures, they will tell you, we are not surprised. And you start carrying yourself as one who, I'm just here. One of the very important questions you need to ask this morning is, the definition of you that you have, who gave you? Who gave you? What you believe about yourself, 
who told you. There are many of you now that if we try to tell you, you look good. You just use religious statement to say, bless God. But you are not receiving it. Because you don't believe it is true. The image that is still on your mind is the image of your secondary school days. Where you have to trek and carry your bags on your head. And you don't believe it. The definition of you that you have now, who gave you? Ask your neighbor, who are you? Who are you? Let me give a bit of breakdown. I'm going to give you 15 signs that you are still trapped in your childhood emotions or mind. Number one, fear and timidity. When you are afraid, you are, you are scared, you are timid, you are not a bold person. Oftentimes, because someone has stalked courage and audacity out of you. Sometimes it can be because a father was missing. One word to give a proper definition. One word to give a proper mentoring. And there are unfortunate cases that the father was better off missing. Was. Because it's a counterfeit of what a real father should be. There are unfortunate cases that the mother was better off missing. And in fact, let me say this to you. There are cases of those who didn't grow up with either or both that it is actually messy. So that God can fill in the gap. We're going to journey towards how to forgive and how to heal from all those stuff. But stay with me. Fear. Second Timothy chapter number 1 verse 7. It's a very popular scripture, but I want you to read it and personalize the reading. For God did not, put your name there, one, two, three, go. For God did not give Femi Lazarus the spirit of timidity, of cowardice, of craven and cringing and frowning fear. But he has given me the spirit of power and of love and of a calm and well-balanced mind and discipline and self-control. I am not afraid. I am bold. I am strong. I will no longer hide in the shadows and hide my giftings and hide for others to shine while I remain hidden. I will be bold. I will manifest my potentials. I will become all that God wants me to become. I will do that all that God wants me to do. I will leave no stone unturned. Unturned. From today, I step out of the shadows and I choose to be bold. I put off my old garment and I walk in boldness. Fear. Changing fear. Fear of being looked at. Fear of being seen. Fear of being heard. Fear of being the only light. Fear of success. Fear of succeeding. Because all those who tried to either died or failed again. And you are now afraid. That let me just be an average person. Maybe I will last longer that way. Fear of people's remarks and opinions. Do you want to write that down? Fear of what they think. You are always thinking. How do they see me? How do they perceive me? Oh, 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 I'm not going to be left alone here now. The way it looks like there's love here. Hope it's not go, oh, 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 the worst is not going to happen again. You are anticipating being hot. You are expecting a fracas. You are expecting that, oh, this church now, that looks like everything is happy. Soon now they will know my character and they are going to leave me now. And That's your mind. That's not Christ. That's your mind. That's not Christ. That when things are looking beautiful, I, say, I know, I know, it doesn't always last. That's your mind. That when someone loves you, you say, I know, it's because they don't know me enough. That's your mind. That's not Christ. 
that when a man comes to your life, it's because he doesn't know my past. That's your mind. That's not Christ. God has not given us the spirit of fear and timidity. The fear of people's remarks and opinions. The fear of starting again. If I let this go, where do I start from? I'd rather stay with what is bad. Because I think this one came by luck. I don't think I have what it takes to attract anyone. Fear of being left alone. Fear of being left alone. And sometimes even by an abuser. You can abuse me, but don't leave me. I've been left alone for so long. Don't go. And when people see that you are afraid of them leaving you, they will haunt you with rejection. In life, we breathe in and breathe out. We gain and we lose. And it's all part of life. Some will come and promise you heaven and earth. And they will go. God help you. You are not looking at that person as the definition of escape from generational pattern. Because the devil is going to kick you right there. The ultimate definition of deliverance is Christ in you. The hope of glory. That's it. Even when prophecies align, people can still walk out of your life and what God has said to you still remains. God has said you will marry a man of God and the man of God broke your heart. And now here's an engineer asking you out. Does that mean God can't call him? And what's your definition of a man of God? The ability to hold mic. Because there are devils holding mics. Fear. Crippling fears. Fear of repeating patterns. And sometimes when people are afraid of repeating patterns, they end up in much more abuse. Oh, my mother raised me as a single mother. If I leave him, I'm going to become a single mother again. But you are dying. And the child is. There's this other one. The fear of being criticized. Don't criticize what I've done. Because when they criticize your works, you feel not accepted. When they tell you there's something you didn't do well, you can hold the pain for days. Because now you earn your definition from works. You earn your definition from approvals. You love it. Because that's what forms the way you see yourself. Why do you wait for people who know nothing about your life to define you? Because they are going to define you from their own lens of mediocrity and sometimes hurt and hatred and sometimes jealousy. Like you can have people who are jealous of you but yet you've given them pen to write about you. And they will find ways to talk you down to their level so they can beat you with experience. Fear of rejection. Fear of being seen. I can't come out. I can't face the crowd. You mean all the church will be looking at me at once? Ah, I would rather dig the ground and enter. What's wrong with being seen? You are important. You are important. Will you ever take the stage in your life? And if yes, when? There are amazing things God is doing in your life. 
But you will never step out to testify. Because you feel you can't. You still remember when you sang special number as a child and you went off key. It's not left you. And whenever you want to come out, you see yourself as that little girl in that gown. Although now you are mature and maybe a mother of children, but you are still a child in there. When will you be the voice in the room that you will speak and you know men should listen because you have something to offer? Enough of texting and sending messages. Whatever you want to say, you will rather write. You can speak. You force yourself to write because you don't want your voice to be heard. And when they read it, you hide your face. So don't read it while I'm watching. fear. Maybe your voice wasn't heard. You grew up in a place where you were only seen and not heard. And now you feel your contribution doesn't matter. You'd rather walk in a group and let someone else take the glory for what you did. And I hid. I said, no, no, don't worry. I don't need it. You do. Some of you have not been able to step into fantastic establishment because you feel it's not for my kind. The woman at the well of Samaria spoke from trauma. How can you, being a Jew, speak with a Samaritan? And when Jesus said, go and call your husband, the response is, I don't have. But she took time to explain you know why? That's the language of trauma. Sometimes they've asked you for something. They say, I know, I know. I know I didn't do well. I know, I know. I failed, right? I know. It didn't come away. I know. Who asked you? Go and call your husband. I don't have. I married one, he died, and then this one. And Jesus said, I know. And even the one you are with now is not your husband. And Jesus did not say, bad woman. Look at your life. So miserable and terrible. You are not worthy of my attention. No. He spoke healing to her soul. That she became so bold, went around, started telling people, I've seen the Messiah. Who told you you've lost your ministry because something failed? And now you feel at 32 that it's just broken pieces of you that's left. Some of you in your 20s, some of you in your 40s, in your 50s, you are thinking, what's left of me? Let me just survive and just go. You are not going anywhere. You will finish. You will recover. You will heal. You will bounce back. You will become all you have ever dreamt of becoming. We refuse for you to conclude about yourself. It's going to go right where you are and bring you out. Some girls think, I can't keep a man. And when a guy breaks their heart, they say they know I'm guilty. But you are not. People, they, they are quick to take blame and say, it's me, it's me, it's me. I know myself. I know, I know. It's me. If you don't, anything he's saying, just let me beg him. It's me. And many times, it's not you. You just grew up from a place where it was only you. And now you thought that if something is wrong, it's you. No. Fears. Fear of making mistakes. I don't want to make any mistake. You get your validation from perfection. Not in the way Christ sees you. Fear of being an object of attraction, of attention. I don't like when people are paying attention to me. I don't like it. I just want to 
Just to myself. Low key. Low key. Fear of being seen. Are you aware that people who don't want to be seen? They don't want you to see them. They just want to be around but not around. Fear of unleashing your potentials. Some can sing, they won't. Some can speak, they won't. Some can write, they won't. Some are qualified to write books, they won't write. Some are qualified to start podcasts, they won't start. Because they always feel it won't be enough. And when they do things, they will criticize it and tear it and criticize it and bash it and say, I know it's not good and it's the best around. But they just won't see it for themselves. They hate the way they sound. They hate the way they sing. Then they wait for you to say they did it well. And I feel, oh, thank you. What if they didn't say that? You are important. You must train yourself to fall in love with you. You must love you first before anyone else can. Because they will treat you the way you feel about yourself. Are you still there? I'm wrapping up now. I know I've taken time. And sometimes it is fear of the unknown. I just don't know what I'm afraid. Some are still afraid of the dark because of the old Madame Koi Koi stories. They are grown now. And there's no Madame Koi Koi. And they know. And when the light goes out, they panic. Because a child is still in there. That needs freedom. That needs freedom. Don't shroud it. Expose it to the Lord to heal you. From Tuesday, I'm going to talk about other signs of being trapped in your old self. I'm going to talk about people pleasing, which is a very important one. I'm going to get into the subject of trauma again. When you are raised in an abusive environment, you are being taught to do life through fear and intimidation. It doesn't live by itself unless you give the Holy Spirit a space to deal with it. All object remains in the state of inertia or rest, or sometimes consistent motion, unless they are compelled to change by an external force acting on them. You won't heal with time. You heal when you allow Christ. Too many cases have been mentioned this morning, and I know that God is intentional about setting his own free. What I want you to do is not to do religious things. But in the next five minutes, we are going to expose our heart to God. See, let me tell you. There is an atmosphere of freedom of the spirit. Where is Nakali? We are going to raise that same sound again. If you want to come out and just pour it out at the feet of the Savior. Eh? Do it. You know, I've told you that you no longer be afraid of expressing yourself. Maybe you start from there. If you want to lay down on the floor, you want to kneel, but just let him know, I yield it to you this morning and I will not leave my life trapped in the abuses of my past, in the abuse of my growing up. I will not live in that. I yield myself to you. So, go ahead before the Lord, every one of us, and cry your eyes out. Heal me completely. Help me. You 
took my pain, you showed me grace at the cross. You took my shame, you showed me grace at the cross where you died for me. And his glory appears like the light from the sun. Age to age he shines Oh, look to the sky Hear the angels cry Singing holy is the Lord And His glory appears like the light from the sun. Singing holy is the Lord. Singing holy is the Lord. Singing holy is the The distortions in your emotions. He heals. He heals. We 
We bless you, Lord. We thank you. The ancient of days. The I am that I am. Take away the pain, the hurt, and the conditions it has created that is refusing to go away. That the wind from your presence will blow, and the weak will become strong. Your children become emboldened again, and strength is restored. Ill homes. Ill hearts, ill traumas, ill experiences. And let there be restoration and wholeness again. We bless you, Father. And we give you all the praise for all that you have done. In Jesus' mighty name. We have prayed. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Let's get up on our feet and thank Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Now, throughout this series, all just allow them, allow them, just please, just all the centers of light nation church are connected here throughout from lagos to ibadan kano portacourt london um, abe okuta ife moro all the places we have our centers those in leki and Ogba. let's give them a big hand Don't miss Bible study for anything because we're about to enter into serious, serious, serious matters. Is that okay? Have you been blessed this morning? Let's give Jesus a big hand. Sit down for a moment. I'm going to pray for those who are giving their tithes max in the next seven to ten minutes we are out of here so we can release all our centers to do their stuff um if you are giving your tight be up standing now so i can pray with you while those who are giving their offering there's been a bit of change um, because of banking issues in recent times in nigeria so um just use the account you can see both online and on site if you're standing make sure i can see you i bless you in the name of jesus that the hand of god rest upon you and i decree that you are blessed with the dew from above and the fatness of the earth and plenty corn and wine in the name of jesus you have all that pertains to life and godliness nothing dies in your hands in jesus mighty name amen please you may be seated according to our custom we understand that giving is an art of worship they raise instrumental worship sounds while we give our offerings online and on site we have the next two minutes to do that